Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracol here, or Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south. And tonight, I have a very special guest who is Leon Schreiber. You might know him if you have been following the, the big language fight that's going down in Stellenbosch that's been going on for quite a few years. Uh, he is a member of the South African Parliament for the Democratic Alliance, and he is the shadow minister for them of public service and administration. And he's also a fighter for Afrikaans, uh, tertiary education at institutions like Stellenbosch. So welcome on the show, Leon. I uh, look forward to the conversation. Before we begin, I know there's a deep irony in uh, having this conversation in English, but as I told my guests before we went live, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the Stellenbosch case study, and I know there's many other uh, communities and cultures out there in the world also fighting a similar type of battles for tertiary education in their mother, mother tongue, and they might be able to learn something from this case study. So I look very, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Great. No, not a problem at all, Adams, and thank you very much for inviting me and also to everyone who's tuned into this conversation. All right. Excellent. So... Leon, let's start off with a very simple question, but it's a question that many people deny or the one of uh, assertion that many people deny. Is there a concerted effort to abolish Afrikaans at Stellenbosch University? Well, it's hard to come to a different conclusion, Adams. If you look at really the last uh, few years, um, there's, there's just uh, a series of, of incidents that have taken place there that make it very hard to sustain an argument that there is not uh, a concerted effort uh, underway to undermine the, the right of access to mother tongue education at Stellenbosch University. And I think one of the important points to make right up front here, of course, is um, tracing this conversation back to the Constitution and those founding values and principles, which make it very clear that where it is reasonably practicable to provide education in uh, someone's chosen language, and in many practical cases, that would be a language other than English. Uh, there is a constitutional duty on organs of state to, to do so, and that obviously then includes public universities. So in the context of Stellenbosch University, uh, given the unique history of that institution, it's very hard to sustain an argument that it doesn't or would not have had the ability to actually offer teaching and learning in Afrikaans, and therefore uh, it is something that it must offer. Uh, but unfortunately, due to uh, what seems to be a lack of political will more than anything else, uh, the Afrikaans offering has been watered down very substantially mm. over the years. And there are a number of incidents that I can go through with you uh, that have happened, uh, perhaps most recently just flagging uh, the alleged ban on the use of Afrikaans even in private spaces like student residences or on park benches on campus uh, with the argument being made that uh, speaking this language is an exclusionary act um, and therefore it, there was this effort to ban its use. Also the, the most recent example, in fact, uh, we just yesterday received opposition from the university to a court case that we've launched along with a student organization called Studenterplan uh, mm. against a very over eager effort by the university to use the COVID pandemic and the switch to online learning as an excuse to do away with the provision of learning materials in Afrikaans, even though that is even still provided in uh, its current language policy. And that's something that uh, the Democratic Alliance and Student Plan have taken to court. These are two examples. I don't know how long you want to talk about examples, but uh, that make it very clear that even where the policy still does uh, make some kind of provision for the use of Afrikaans learning materials, that uh, there was uh, a great eagerness to use the COVID pandemic as, as an example to, to do away with that. Mm. No, well, I can speak from experience. I am an ex-Marty. I, uh, I did my degree there. And uh, I witnessed it firsthand. I was a first year student in 2015, and uh, I saw how Afrikaans was slowly uh, being pushed out at the university. And I know this is anecdotal evidence, but from my experience, I could see it happening. There was no effort being made to uh, accommodate Afrikaans students at an, uh, of a university that says it's offering Afrikaans as a language of uh, tertiary education. And uh, it was pretty much incentivized. Uh, uh, students were incentivized to not study in their own language. I remember in first year 
I studied in Africa. I trans I all the the textbooks were in English. So I translated all the textbooks by hand into like a, le a, a ledger into Afrikaans so I could study from it because it was it, it was easier for me to study in my mother tongue. But then second year came around and it was just impossible. I couldn't keep up with the amount of work that I had to do double the work to translate it because all the classes were in English and uh, the amount of Afrikaans that you ever uh, were exposed to while studying was very minimal. Uh, the only opportunity I remember that I had uh, to get uh, any Afrikaans exposure in my tertiary education at Stellenbosch was you had the option if you didn't understand something in class to raise your hand and ask a question in Afrikaans. That was the, the extent of it. Now, before we continue, I just want to read here some comments that we've gotten already from the chat. Sideliner Opinion says, Leon is doing great work in Stellenbosch for the rights of Afrikaans students to be taught in their mother tongue. And then he follows up that by saying, Anglicizing Stallies is an exclusionary act uh, of Afrikaans students who are not e uh, efficient in academic English. Now, I mean, that is definitely something that we can get into later in the, in the conversation is how this affects the academic pr uh, prestige of many students uh, not being able to study in their mother tongue. I mean, like I said, I can talk from personal experience on how this affected my studies. But Leon, from what, uh, what's your take uh, and the DA's uh, take on this situation where how is this affecting uh, students' studies that are first language Afrikaans? I think it's a critical point and again uh, something that that just shows how nuanced you actually have to be when you approach this because there are a couple of facts in the background that are important to make in this conversation. One of these key facts is that when you look at high school education in South Africa, Afrikaans is the only indigenous language due to the failure of the national government for the past 27 years, Afrikaans is, is almost the only indigenous language at any school where you can still finish a high school diploma or a matric certificate um, in your mother tongue. So there are thousands of students who spent their entire school career, primary schools and high schools, learning and studying in Afrikaans. Um, and as you said earlier, uh, Stellenbosch University has used a very interesting approach to this phasing out of Afrikaans where they've tried to, the, it seems like the more they phase out Afrikaans, the louder they protest that they're multilingual and that Afrikaans does have a, a, a place there. So many students, especially uh, students from rural areas, but also, of course, we know that more than half of the Western Cape and the Northern Cape's population are first language Afrikaans speakers. Many students from those areas and from, like I said, high schools where they spent their entire school career studying in Afrikaans, uh, do go to Stellenbosch University uh, under the assumption or impression that there will be the opportunity for them, if not to study completely in Afrikaans, but the ability for them to, uh, to gain the necessary skills and competencies also in other languages like English for them to be successful. And what they find now uh, and as this, this most recent case actually quite brutally demonstrates is that you may arrive from a, a, a community like Uppington or whatever the case may be at Stellenbosch University and your first interaction with language at this place is that you are told that the language that you spent your entire school career studying in, the language your mother tongue, the language you grew up in, one of the official languages of the country, you're not allowed to actually speak even in the privacy of your own residence. So. This is this is a disgraceful uh, state of affairs for this kind of thing to be happening. And if you take that initial uh, anecdote and you, you take it through the uh, university career of, of these young people, you'll see that because they went to school their entire lives in Afrikaans and suddenly they are forced to make this switch where they thought they were going to be at a university where there will be support for them or the ability to study in Afrikaans, um, it is something that has a very, very negative effect, not only on their grades, obviously, but also on the psychological state or the ability to actually enjoy their student experience uh, because it fundamentally is not what they were being promised or expected. And, and I think therein lies really the fundamental motivation also for people like myself and, and my party who want to fix this situation is to say, that where there is this kind of obvious, blatant uh, exclusion of people on the basis of language, and especially in the case where they, they, they've only ever known one language when they were at school, when you have the 
ability to offer teaching in that language, you really must offer it. And we will apply the political pressure needed to actually make that happen. And that is the, the, the task that we are busy with. Mm. No, absolutely, uh, Leon. And uh, also to add to that, Afrikaans is the third most spoken language in South Africa. And uh, you can't even grant the language one university in the province where it is the, uh, the most spoken. It's, it's absolutely a farce. There's definitely an agenda. There's definitely something else that people are trying to accomplish here. And it's really sad to see. I mean, I know of people that uh, have been, uh, have, uh, have had this, have had the, have had their studies impacted through this type of discrimination. Now, talking about discrimination, do you have any other uh, evidence that you can share with how Afrikaans students are treated on, on campus? Well, um, so, so I've mentioned some of the, the most um, egregious examples. Um, but one of the things that's also going wrong at the moment is, is actually in, in the lecture halls, uh, where the language policy uh, provides in a very limited number of cases for parallel medium teaching, where there will be separate classes in English and Afrikaans, which is fundamentally uh, the same approach that these students had at high schools, where many dual medium high schools, it's a system that they're used to, and in many ways is the most effective way to do this. Um, interestingly, just an anecdote uh, of, of, of difference perhaps with many other campus settings is that uh, in the various court cases that they've been over this uh, matter, the Constitutional Court actually found that in the context of Stellenbosch University, the use of parallel meeting teaching does actually not amount to racial discrimination because the speakers of Afrikaans are such a diverse group, especially in this uh, part of the country. Uh, so that is one mechanism, but where it becomes highly problematic is where there's uh, so-called dual medium teaching, where you're supposed to be using both of these languages in the same in the same class, and uh, but the language policy actually only provides for a summary of Afrikaans uh, in Afrikaans or, or answers to questions, as you said, in Afrikaans. But what we're finding now, increasingly, from students after, especially this latest abuse, essentially, of the COVID pandemic and the switch to online teaching is that even that little provision that, that was previously made is no longer being honored or being implemented. So you're finding that uh, presentations, notes, materials that are supposed to be available as, mm. as, as, as the very least that a student would need if they're unable to follow everything in class, at the very least to have uh, those learning materials. It's no longer being made available. And you know it's, it's been quite a journey to find out exactly how the university arrived at this position, uh, because it was already in last year that um, that the university took this decision, as soon as the COVID pandemic hit essentially, to do away with, uh, the uh, to deviate from the language policy's provision that Afrikaans learning materials should be made available. They initially said it would be in place for one semester, but they said that after it had already been in place for two semesters. And then we found out most recently that it actually continues in this current semester. So it's four semesters, two years now, during which there has been this deviation. And we've got evidence that uh, correct procedures were not followed as this thing was, was rammed through essentially the system. Um, so those are two very, I think, uh, high profile examples. But, mm. you know, there are many other cases where, where you would find anecdotes again, and that's what makes it very difficult. Um, and that's why I'm grateful to an organization like Student Plan who provides support actually for students who have these individual experiences to come together uh, and mount a, a kind of uh, challenge or an effort to say that we have these rights and we want to secure them. Uh, but we've certainly, I mean, I was there with John Stiernes and the leader of the DA uh, when some of these incidents took place. And we're actually hearing some of those stories firsthand from students, uh, you know, stories where people who are brushing their teeth in the morning are told you can't speak Afrikaans while you're in the bathroom to brush your teeth. Or someone who's speaking with their parents on the phone in Afrikaans walking by someone else's room and then someone shouts at them, English, please. These are the kind of things hard to measure and, and hard to always uh, sort of put a, put a quantitative number on. But, but these are the, the red flags going up about um, essentially, I think, a culture that has been created and fostered uh, by the management at the university. Mm. And these students, uh, from, what I, from what I can understand, don't really have any uh, incentive to lie. So uh, when it comes to these types of incidents, I've also heard some very troubling uh, things from, from that side, from Stellenbosch, uh, also working with uh, Studenteplein. I know some of the guys there. And then uh, 
something that also needs to be taken into account is the fact that this is a battle that's been going on for a long while. It's been coming uh, for quite a few years. Now, uh, maybe not to, uh, to waste too much time on it, but could you maybe give a very short summary of the timeline on how we got here and where it started with this whole, uh, this whole campaign against Afrikaans at Stellenbosch? So language uh, at Stellenbosch University, I think, has been contentious for a long time. And what I would say is that I think it, it, is, it is important to have a holistic view and say that there are different languages in use at the university. And we understand the arguments for why being fluent in English is important in a global world. Well, no one is against uh, the ability of, of South Africans to be multilingual and especially also to be able to use English. And I think this idea that it is a trade-off, that there's either going to be uh, so-called English students uh, or Afrikaans students that, can, that should be accommodated and, and empowered. That is where the root of the problem really lies. It has been contentious for a long time, but I think it really reached a tipping point with the rise of the fallist movement, um, mm. which was also expressed very much at Stellenbosch University by an organization called Open Stellenbosch, which was an overtly ideological politically motivated uh, undertaking. And, and, you know, this was during a period of great upheavals on university campuses at the University of Cape Town. Paintings were being set on fire. Uh, you know, there was, there was great violence across uh, sort of the university landscape. And it manifested a bit differently at Stellenbosch University, but perhaps with more lasting effects than in, in many other places. Because at Stellenbosch, uh, it became an argument about Afrikaans being a white language, about it being uh, a racist endeavor to um, provide teaching in this language, which is, which is absolutely the opposite of what Afrikaans is today. Afrikaans is the most racially diverse language in South Africa. It is the key to empowerment for millions of, of, of disadvantaged South Africans, in, 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 certainly in the Western Cape, but in many other parts of the country as well. And so it, it, it got this very uh, ideological and political flavor the management of the university were very eager to side with uh, what, what uh, you know, they probably referred to themselves as revolutionaries at the time. And uh, that's where the uh, changes came in, in the form of the 2016 language policy, which essentially and fundamentally uh, removed the equality between Afrikaans and English. And I think that's really an important uh, marker in this whole conversation is that up until that moment, there was a there was an attempt. It was clumsy sometimes, it was difficult, and it is complicated um, to make it work in practice. But there was always an understanding that in principle, there, there's a striving here for equality uh, between Afrikaans and English uh, at this university. 2016, that went out the window, and essentially Stellenbosch became an English first university uh, with some decorations along the edges uh, using Afrikaans and Isiklosa to some extent as well to uh, create the impression of multilingualism. And that's why I said earlier that the university uh, seems to talk more and more about multilingual as they become more and more monolingual. Um, and that's where many of the things that we are now seeing manifest, the initial warnings went up. And there was, of course, the famous Galeika cancer uh, court case against the 2016 mm. policy, which in many ways, at the end of the day, that case turned on uh, the idea of this being theoretical, uh, you know, the, the policy is not in force, so you can't say the policy is going to cause X, Y, and Z. Well, obviously, mm -hmm. we're a few years down the line now, and all of the examples that I've mentioned to you, in my view, are the direct result of uh, an environment or an atmosphere. Hindsight that... is horrible, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if that's what it takes sometimes for people to see how things manifest, mm. uh, then, then, you know, that, that's, uh, that's the road you walk. Mm, absolutely. Now, uh, I have a question here from the from the audience. Uh, Baron Smith asks, why, do, why does Stellenbosch University keep accepting people who hate speaking Afrikaans? So I think there's a broader question here. Is Stellenbosch actually actively trying to uh, not accept uh, Afrikaans students and do they want to be turn themselves into just an English university? Uh, why, uh, why are they accepting people that are coming into a university that, that want to change the university's uh, whole 
uh, structure and want to change the university from a, a university that gives education in Afrikaans to a strictly English one. I mean, you're you're taking something away. You're not creating anything. Uh, there are plenty of English universities across the country, but uh, Stellenbosch doesn't seem to be very uh, uh, very passionate about defending that small thing that makes them unique and how they are providing a service for millions of South Africans. Yeah, I mean, I, just as a first point, it's always frustrating to me the idea that uh, there are people who argue very strongly that by removing Afrikaans as a language of teaching, you're actually uh, creating equality or expanding uh, the opportunities for other uh, languages. That That's not true. If you If you want to actually make other languages, other South African languages into languages of of the academy, as our constitution suggests you should be doing as a government, then the way to do that is to lift up those languages, not to be tearing mm. down um, that which is already there. I think the bigger question or, or my response to the question is, um, I think a lot of the fault here lies with the management. I don't think that there are actually that many students who go to Stellenbosch with this great uh, idea of of tearing down the institution in mind. In fact, I think many people go there because they understand it is an excellent university um, and it offers you uh, a world of, of diversity, actually. Um, and that's, again, where multilingualism is such a, a great catalyst for, for real meaningful diversity. Um, and I think there are a lot of students who go there, both English and Afrikaans speaking uh, and uh, people who speak other languages uh, as their first language. Um, who understand that there's something really enriching about that environment. But it's about the disappointment that so many people feel when they get there and they see that, uh, in fact, the management of the university as, uh, you know, over the years has created a situation where what they are promised or offered is not actually what, um, what exists in practice. And, and people go to Stellenbosch, I think, because they understand it to be a multilingual place, a diverse place, a place that offers not only excellent uh, education, but also a place that really lets you grapple with South Africa in, in its fullness. And, and South Africa is not exclusively an English speaking country. It is not, and certainly the Western Cape uh, is not a region of the world where everyone uh, only speaks English. And so you actually take that away from people when you try to enforce this kind of idea that English is the only way or gateway into, into a successful future. And I, and I might just add also, Adams, that um, the idea that excellence can only be found in English um, or that our country can only progress uh, through, you know, mastery of academic English is such a misguided one if you just go outside of the big urban areas and see the enormous need for education, for teachers, for doctors, for accountants, for mm. professionals, who can serve communities where people do not conduct their business or their lives primarily in English. And we've, we've really, I think, um, created a distorted picture of, of the economic value that is locked up uh, in the idea of actually empowering people in their communities to serve their communities as well. It doesn't mean that you should not be able to speak English. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to study in English or even become fluent and excellent in English as well. But it, it does mean that if we are to really celebrate our diversity uh, in a meaningful way, also economically, then we're going to have to uh, understand that the investments we need to make include things like multilingualism at uh, school and university level. Hmm. Absolutely. And I also don't buy that argument uh, that uh, you have to speak English to be able to have the world open to you. Uh, that that's that'll be have to be news to the Japanese, to the Germans, to the Russians. They all seem to be completely misguided according to this logic, uh, where they are giving people the opportunity of tertiary education in their mother tongue. Uh, it's a very strange argument. It's, I don't think it's looking at the the bigger picture. I mean, we have multiple examples of South Africans that studied in Afrikaans in South Africa and went on to be very successful wherever they went. Um, I, I think, as you said earlier, being proficient in Afrikaans doesn't mean you can't also do your job in English very efficiently. Um, yeah. And here's the, there's another big question that comes in, and this is, I think, the crux of many of these cases uh, in any type of debate in South Africa surrounding Afrikaans. And, that, that, and you mentioned it earlier. It's the thing about indigenous languages. Uh, 
where the ANC have the audacity to call Af uh, Afrikaans a non-indigenous language. Now, there's a great argument against that I always use, and I ask those types of people, then where is it an indigenous language to if it's not in South Africa? There's nowhere else where it is spoken uh, the, as widely as in South Africa. It originated here. Um, what, is, what are your thoughts on that, that, very, uh, that very popular argument uh, against the Afrikaans tertiary education and against Afrikaans as a language? Well, and actually, uh, I think it, is, it has moved from being a popular argument to, to being an official argument, uh, because mm. you'll know that this uh, new uh, language policy framework for higher education that was published by Minister Bladen's on Monday uh, actually overtly classifies Afrikaans as a foreign language. I mean, it is a breathtaking thing to see uh, a government uh, making something, you know, the kind of argument that is not only scientifically wrong, but it, it goes against every uh, principle that we're trying to to Im embed in this country. And you know what's actually the most breathtaking thing, or just that shows the narrow-mindedness, um, is that it's not only Afrikaans that's excluded from their definition of an indigenous language, but it is also mm. Kwekwe Kwa and other Sun and Nama and Khoi languages. These are languages that were spoken thousands of years ago already, only in Southern Africa. And uh, yet the, the government has the audacity to try and tell the speakers of those languages as well that they are not indigenous uh, to or their language is not indigenous. So um, it is not only something that uh, I reject, it is something that I'm actively working against. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I laid actually a complaint with UNESCO, the, the United Nations uh, Organization for, for Culture, Education and Language. Uh, over the refusal of the government to correct what is an obviously incorrect classification, which mm -hmm. will have enormously negative consequences uh, for those languages which are now excluded from the, the classification. The reason for it being so dangerous is because that policy explicitly says that its goal is to develop and strengthen indigenous languages. And then it defines indigenous languages in a way which excludes Afrikaans uh, and the Koi, Nama and Sun languages. And the implication there is obvious to anyone that it means the investments needed to develop and, and, uh, and strengthen these languages will not be made in what is being regarded by the national government as foreign languages. Uh, mm. So this is a very dangerous road to start walking down. That is why, uh, you know, for the past year, essentially, we have been fighting this battle. I can't tell you how many times I've written to the minister parliamentary questions. We've uh, launched a public petition around this. Uh, complaints with the Human Rights Commission. Uh, uh, John Steen has actually wrote a letter directly to the president as well over this. And, and at the end of the day, uh, there's just no willingness uh, to actually fix what is actually a simple thing to fix, but could have really far-reaching consequences. So, you know, that is why we are we have turned to the international community now. And my plea would be also to anyone actually watching this tonight who uh, who may uh, not be from South Africa to understand. The, the danger that is uh, locked up in this idea of othering uh, communities or languages in South Africa, which are plainly as indigenous as the Protea or the Springbok or anything else to this part of the world. Um, and it is something, unfortunately, that kind of, again, atmosphere or context has filtered through into our universities. And that is why Stellenbosch University, in its first draft of its uh, reviewed or revised language policy, actually use that very same definition uh, to say that Afrikaans is not an indigenous language. And I think it is a brazen insult to the people of South Africa, not only to the people who speak Afrikaans, uh, but to South Africans writ large, because it is nonsense, it is untrue, and I think it is hateful. Mm. And it is something that, that I'm certainly working as much as possible against to make sure that we get it fixed. Hmm. No, thank you very much, uh, Leon, for your fight there as well, for the language that I love and I know you love as well. Now. What you said there is very important, and that's the 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 whole context around Afrikaans and Africa. I mean, Africa is in the name. So, I mean, if you want to uh, really try and make uh, the argument that Afrikaans is non-indigenous, uh, you need to stretch before you reach. Um, there's a very big victory for Afrikaans that happened this year at UNISA through a court case that uh, AfriForum lodged. Um, and I know you also acknowledge the, the significance of it. Could you maybe explain the, the significance of that court ruling that we had with Afrikaans at UNISA this year? Absolutely. And, and, I, and, and, and the DA has been very open about this, and I've been very frank about this, that I'm grateful for the work that's been going 
into this particular issue uh, from Africa Forum's side um, to to get what what could be. Um, you know, one doesn't want to be overly optimistic in, in an environment where we know there's so much um, uh, animosity against uh, uh, the, the use of Afrikaans. But I think it could signal the beginning of a turning point. Um, and I think what what was laid down in that court ruling. Even though UNISA has the opportunity to again revise or have a second bite at the cherry at revising their language policy, perhaps in a way that again will seek to minimize the status of Afrikaans, I think a marker was laid down to say, at the very least, uh, there are situations in which the government may not remove the use of Afrikaans. And we now know that some of those situations include distance learning. Again, going back to that earlier point about uh, the issue of discrimination in, in, in classrooms, which obviously does not occur uh, when there's distance learning and people are studying uh, remotely. Um, so I think it, at the very least, uh, gives us something to work from. It establishes a foundation or, or a floor, perhaps is the right word, to mm -hmm. say that uh, beyond this, uh, the, 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 the courts will not tolerate uh, the diminishing uh, of Afrikaans. And I think very interesting that Ernest now is that uh, it is a relevant issue in the case that we've brought against Stellenbosch University, because as I mentioned earlier, the entire argument was that for whatever reason, uh, the provision of Afrikaans learning materials uh, should cease because of the shift to distance learning. Well, we now know that in fact, it is the, op the other way around, that where there's distance learning, there's actually a higher threshold uh, and there's a bigger uh, need for, for multilingualism. Mm -hmm. Because there's no argument about uh, this kind of discrimination in classrooms, etc. Um, so I think in that sense, it is highly relevant to the current case. But in general, I think it's also an important marker and one which we and I think many other organizations working in this space uh, would like to build upon uh, and, and take forward for Afrikaans, but also for our other indigenous languages. And I think it's an important point to make. I made it earlier, but to emphasize again, the enormous work that remains for us to actually elevate other indigenous South African languages, because also that is the best way to also uh, neutralize this assault against uh, Afrikaans um, over the long term, is to make sure that every South African has the ability to find um, access to, to resources or education in their mother tongue. Uh, and so the UNISA ruling is important also for the speakers of other indigenous languages, mm. because if we are to ever develop Isizulu uh, or Sesutu to the level that we want it to be academically, um, then we're going to have to know that the courts are willing to take a stand, as they've done in the UNISA case. Hmm. No, uh, that, uh, that makes perfect sense. Now, uh, Leon, uh, uh, you talked about the DA's involvement uh, at, at, in the, the fight for Afrikaans at uh, Stellenbosch. And we actually have a question from uh, from the audience that came in before we went live uh, regarding that, uh, more of a, a critical uh, question of the DA, and I'll, I'd like to give you the, the opportunity to respond to it. So the question was from a viewer, uh, asked, the DA was relatively absent with the adoption of the ministerial language policy, also in the Stellenbosch University language debate that started raging early as 2016 and through the language struggles at other universities. Why before the election and suddenly now make these giant waves? The UNISA case is a convenient coincidence. How do you explain that this is not just political opportunism? Uh, what would your response to that, uh, that critique be? Look, I'm, I think critical questions are often the ones that uh, take us the furthest. So I have no problem with that. And thank you to the, mm. the viewer who sent that in. Um, I do want to make the general point uh, first, though, that I don't think that uh, skepticism there's a difference between skepticism um, and cynicism. And I think we mustn't fall into the trap of cynicism uh, as much as we should be skeptical. And, and, and with that having been said, I think there's reason for skepticism. I don't dismiss uh, uh, people who are skeptical about the DA to a certain extent um, in this, on this issue and more generally when it comes to multilingualism. And there's a very good reason for that. We, we understand what happened prior to 2019 we know that there were mistakes made and in fact there was an entire review process conducted uh, in the DA, the report of which was published online and is actually available for anyone uh, to find online and I really would encourage uh, viewers to take a look at that and see just how directly the party confronted the responsibility we have also to the speakers of Afrikaans. And I think there's a critical point to be made, Adams, about 
the the approach of the DA or, or why I also personally so strongly associate with the DA as, as a liberal party for all South Africans. And we can have our disagreements about many things. But for me, the point is that a big organization that caters or that seeks to enforce the rights of as many people as possible is the strongest way forward also when it comes to enforcing the rights of the Afrikaans speaking community. However, then you must genuinely be working to make that a reality. You cannot mm. abstractly say that uh, we want to build a future where everyone's rights are protected. You must then actually go out and protect everyone's rights. And that is where the work of the DA is much more difficult than political organizations which overtly seek to cater only for one uh, group or, or a small subset of our population because we have to go out and we have to fight the issues that matter to South Africans of diverse backgrounds. But here's the great thing. That's why you can have an Engelsman like John Steenhuizen <laughs> very passionately fighting this issue. That's why you can have Muslim South Africans standing up for the rights of Christian South Africans, uh, black South Africans with white South Africans. That is, that is the goal. That is, that is what we strive for as, as a political organization. And I think the mistakes of the past in seeking once again to, to seek to make a choice, we can either be for them or for them. That is where the problems came in. And that is where a lot of the indecisiveness uh, and issues, of course, uh, like the Schweizer Reinecke incident, uh, which really just illustrated where the, that leadership was taking the party manifested. However, the good news is that we are an organization that not only conducted a review report, we published that, we made it public, and we've been implementing its recommendations really quite relentlessly over the last couple of years. And I think the proof is there. Uh, in an example like uh, standing up at Stellenbosch University, uh, where we, in the past, uh, I was not there, I only became an MP in 2019, but I can understand the skepticism about why this was not being done earlier. But we can either be, uh, you know, sit and cry over sp spilled milk, or we can get down and do the hard work, which uh, is certainly what I'm interested in doing and what I know that John and the leadership of the DA are interested in doing. All right. And uh, I got a comment here from uh, Sideliner Opinions. He says, yes, Leon, this battle is not only about Afrikaans. Other languages deserve the same privilege. Now, that actually leads me into a question. What is the, What are the implications of this battle for Afrikaans tertiary education for other indigenous languages in South Africa? Well, I think the, it's, it's, some, it's sometimes a difficult point to make, but it, 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 it's nonetheless true that uh, Afrikaans currently is the most academically developed indigenous language, and we understand the reasons for that. And, and, and we must acknowledge why, again, a lot of people uh, look skeptically towards even that point and say that the, all the abuses of history uh, cannot be chucked out the window and they should not be chucked out the window. But the point is that uh, if a place like Stellenbosch cannot even fulfill the constitutional requirements for mother tongue education, in this case Afrikaans, which has all the, the academic resources and other things that you need to actually practically do this, then what chance will we have of making the same true of, for example, the use of Zulu at the University of, of KwaZulu-Natal um, or Fort Hare in the Eastern Cape and the use of Isikosa? Uh, if we are not serious about the one language where it is, you know, quote unquote, the easiest to actually provide this kind of education, then how will we ever scale the mountain of actually developing our other indigenous languages as well? And I am an Afrikaans speaking person. This is my contribution to this issue. But by no means should it ever be uh, framed or perceived as a choice or saying you can either have Afrikaans or you can have your other indigenous languages. It is the mm. opposite. Afrikaans' future is going to be best protected when we develop all of our indigenous languages, when we get other communities to also join hands with us in this, in this uh, quest. And I think that's why it is important for, that, for those communities as well, because Afrikaans is, is I think, uh, one of three languages to have developed a full academic status in the last 200 years or something. And um, mm. there are lessons to be learned from that. And I think that is the that is the future, not only for Afrikaans, but for all our indigenous languages uh, to say, we have this resource, Afrikaans has these resources, let's learn from it, let's expand it to other languages, 
And certainly tearing down the one that is developed in no way develops the others. That is, that is clear. Mm. All right. No, I completely agree. Um, I, like I always say on this show as well, I want to live in a world in a hundred years where there are still people speaking Zulu, still speak people speaking Sichuana, still people speaking, uh, Chonga. It's, uh, they are all instruments in the, in the symphony or in the orchestra of God. And I think uh, if one of those languages were to die out, that's one instrument that's never going to play again, as Impe van Weyck Lowe said. Um, now, there's, this is maybe the, the most difficult question that I wanted to ask you, but uh, I hope you can provide us some insights. Maybe even I will indulge you in a little speculation even as well with this one. But what is Stellenbosch University, according to, in your opinion, trying to achieve with this uh, phasing out of Afrikaans and this onslaught against Afrikaans at their institution? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that is a hard one. I've, you know, I've grappled with that because if you can understand the goals or the aims, then uh, you better understand the strategy and tactics if, you're, if you can get the answer to that question. Um, but I think, it, although there is a, a bit of speculation involved, I think we have seen um, some hints from, from, the, from the organization. So the first one would be that uh, this idea of international uh, rankings or prestige is essentially the be-all and the end-all. Uh, the university exists to uh, improve its position on certain international rankings. Now, of course, uh, those things are relevant. And again, I will no, none of us should dismiss that. It, it's a competitive world out there. And uh, our universities need to attract the best talent, the best research capacity. There's nothing wrong with that per se. The issue comes when you start emphasizing that to the exclusion of all else. And I think that that is where uh, the university is starting to find itself. Uh, because, again, as the example I made earlier, um, how do you actually measure on a global ranking the impact of training doctors who will serve rural African speaking communities or communities uh, in other languages where there's a great need um, uh, for access to things like teachers? And, and healthcare services. So we have to understand in South Africa that the local context and the need in our local communities, you cannot isolate yourself or separate yourself from that and then say that you are uh, fulfilling the kind of developmental uh, needs that we have in South Africa. So language is, is critically linked with the idea of also uh, using a university to empower and serve local communities. So I think you, when you become, uh, you know, you move in circles like that, you're in your world, perhaps as the management or as powerful people in the university, is uh, much more centered around uh, Geneva or Paris than it actually is around Kakamas or, or, or Springbok. And, mm -hmm. and then I think you, you, you lose contact uh, or, or with reality to some extent. Um, and you start operating as if the judgments of Geneva is what really determines your success mm. and your impact. And that is probably the, the closest I can get, Adams, to a, a meaningful answer. Mm. It is probably more complicated than that, but I think that's certainly a big part of, of mm. how we got no, I think that's a, that's a valu very valuable insight into uh, what we're seeing there. I also have my own theories, but uh, tonight's about your insights, not mine. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's the, another thing we are talking about the, the problem itself, but there, there has to be solutions as well. I mean, there's a fight going on. That's one side of it, but there's also another side of it. That's a building element. Now, uh, uh, I work for Afri Forum, part of the solidarity movement, and we've built, for example, Soltech and Afrikaans technical college that already is catering to uh, almost a thousand students by now. And uh, also academia, our private Afrikaans university. What are your thoughts on this building side of building alternatives to preserve the language and give people the opportunity of all backgrounds and all communities, as long as they can speak Afrikaans and want to learn in Afrikaans to come to these uh, new private institutions like Soltech and academia? What are your thoughts on that route as an also uh, uh, a route of a solution to uh, preserving Afrikaans and giving young students the opportunities they need to be as successful as possible? Well, I think the first thing to say is that in, in an environment where our country is in, in such desperate need of skills, uh, you know, it is, it is phenomenal to see uh, the, the kind of work that is going in uh, to the, essentially the production of, of the talent of the future and the skills we're going to need to build this economy going forward. So anyone who contributes to that, 
uh, should be saluted for that. But of course, the, 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 the language issue and the ability to train people in those languages, again, as I said, to go and then serve communities where, where people operate in those languages, um, makes it even more valuable, Alan. And, and I think there shouldn't be a, a trade-off necessarily. I think it, it takes both sides. Uh, you have to uh, stand up where things are going wrong, and then you must also offer solutions. And I think that is very clear in the examples that you've cited, uh, when people put their money where their mouth is, quite literally. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that is, that is positive. However, I do want to say uh, that it is a shame, and it would be a real shame. And, and, and perhaps we agree on this, maybe we don't. But it would be a real shame if the use of our indigenous languages as as academic languages is entirely uh, moved into the private sphere because mm. I think there's great value in having these multilingual diverse uh, experiences in the public domain as well because at the end of the day the constitution and, and our public institutions have to provide certain things to us as the people and and it would be very sad if we have a public university sector that is only English and then private institutions starting to cater for some of our specific indigenous languages. It wouldn't be sad in the sense that uh, that's better than not having them. It would be sad in the sense that I think there's, there's a civic element that, that is positive if you can have multilingualism, multilingual institutions where people from entirely different backgrounds can come together and meet and uh, have this university experience as equals, uh, but through their culture, their language, and, and in the way that they are best able mm. to learn. Um, so I think we, that is why it is important for, for us to hold the line as much as possible at public institutions. I don't think it takes anything away from the importance of, of, of creating those private institutions. I think it, the, the two complement one another. And then perhaps just finally to say, um, We've been very clear about solutions at Stellenbosch too. And although it is complex and it is difficult, there are solutions. And the, the solutions begin by what I said earlier about recognizing that the goal should be that at that institution, there must at least be equality between those two languages, which are practically possible at that institution. And I think it's a principal fight uh, before everything else, because if you can get the principle right, you can get other aspects of the policy and the practicality working towards that. Unfortunately, at the moment, the situation is that the principle essentially is that this is an English institution with some decorations in other languages. And once you adopt that kind of principle, uh, you're only working away from multilingualism at the end of the day. So that is, you know, in everything we've done, we've put our solution on the table to say that's where the conversation of a solution must begin. And then we can have real in-depth looks at uh, technology, for example. Again, the shift to distance learning and what technology makes possible. Uh, you know, translating through voice to text, you know, there has been enormous progress in that, in that regard. Um, so, so a lot of these things that used to be so labor intensive and expensive are becoming cheaper and cheaper. It's almost a bit like renewable energy where everyone said it, only, it could only be coal. And, and as we go along, we're seeing that um, other options are becoming available to us. And if you had the principle right of saying that we pursue uh, equality and multilingualism, you would be harnessing those technological solutions uh, to a much greater extent than is the case right now. Mm. And before I get to my final question, uh, just uh, one you can briefly answer, uh, seeing as you are working with them, and I know the good uh, good oaks over there at Studenta Plain, uh, what are your thoughts on the work that they are doing as a very young organization uh, fighting the fight for Afrikaans at Stellenbosch? No, I'm, I'm very inspired by them, right? to, be, to be very honest about it. They, they also put their money where their mouth is. And, uh, you know, although people may know them as an organization that uh, is, is fighting the fight in the court and in other places uh, with the Human Rights Commission, uh, et cetera, alongside us as well, they also do a lot of excellent work that the university should be doing. They are translating the study materials that the university says it's no longer possible to provide. They are actually... Um, you know, working with students to get notes available in Afrikaans uh, from, from lectures uh, being made av available to uh, especially first year students. You know, if you go back to that situation that I, I uh, painted a bit earlier about how first year students, 18 year olds, who've only ever learned to study in Afrikaans show up at, at the university. 
uh, and then have this experience of being forced to go into this English mode, uh, student plan plays a critical role in actually uh, making it possible for them to, to try and succeed and not drop out. And so I think um, those are the kind of solutions that show the way forward to us. But it is very sad to me that uh, a group of committed uh, students are doing some of the things that the university really should be doing. Uh, and it puts the lie, in fact, to the suggestion that these things are not possible. They are possible. They are happening. Mm. No, uh, I think they'll, uh, they'll appreciate those kind words. So um, finally, what I want to know is what the future holds. So this is, I'm going to incorporate a viewer question that I got also uh, sent to me before the show. So that question was, what are the DA going to do differently in this language fight compared to the previous ones? Greater public pressure, another court case. And I'm going to combine that viewer question with my own of what does the future hold? Uh, can you give us some insights on that? So I think there are a couple of short term things uh, before we, we look a bit further. Uh, I think we have to win this fight about uh, classifying uh, Afrikaans as an indigenous language. I think that's that's the most immediate one. Um, so we will be using whatever kind of mechanisms we have, and we certainly have been doing that, and we continue to do that, um, to make sure that, that we get that rectified. Because again, then at a very high level, you start creating this flaw, and people can't go around anymore saying uh, that, you know, this language doesn't qualify for support because it's not indigenous. So that is an important thing to get right, uh, I think, in the short term. Uh, then, obviously, the, the work at Stellenbosch uh, will continue. And I think the, the, the role of, of having actually the official opposition, I don't think we should underestimate um, the impact it has when, when a big political party like the DA actually stands up and says, you know, we're not going to uh, sit by and allow this to happen. And um, it is a long and protracted and difficult uh, fight that I have been involved in with for, for years now. And I don't think anyone should claim or, or pretend that there's going to be easy victories here or anything like that. And that's not what I'm uh, certainly not telling people tonight. I think it is a long and a hard graft to establish the, the momentum and, 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 the, and the, the red lines uh, in our society that say we are willing to go this far and no further. And I think, as I said earlier, the UNISA case is, is one element of that. And if we can get to a point at Stellenbosch University where we can imprint on the management of the university that certain things will not be accepted and that they cannot move beyond that, then at least we will have uh, stopped the bleeding uh, to, to some extent. And I know that that is in many ways a really, it's a sad thing to actually be working on. It's not the most, you know, you'd, you'd much rather be, as you said earlier, be building something uh, great than stopping something great from from dying, um, mm. but but sometimes that's what it takes. Uh, so I think in the more medium term, if we can get enough victories lined up, and I think absolutely critical, and this is something that has started to happen, is really galvanizing public support and public pressure around this issue. Um, I I don't recall ever seeing the kind of uh, sustained public outrage taking different forms. In, in the Afrikaans media and in other places about what is going on at Stellenbosch University. And we've also seen the creation of new civil society movements, um, the Dark Network being an interesting new example um, of, of a, an organization catering for previously disadvantaged Afrikaans speakers and saying that you are disadvantaging people uh, who were actually excluded from Stellenbosch University on the basis of race in the past and are now being excluded uh, on the basis of the language they speak. And, you know, they have organized uh, protest actions and other things that I think are, are also making a very mm. important contribution to this effort. So it will be, it will be like everything uh, in the political sphere and in life. It is something that you have to stick with and, and really see it through. But uh, if I may, from my side, just say that the commitment is absolutely there. And I hope that the viewers... Uh, at the very least, um, you know, guarding their skepticism uh, uh, closely because it is important, uh, can, can see there's no real need for cynicism here. There's a genuine commitment, not only from myself, but from the, the top leadership of the Democratic Alliance, uh, that we are going to see this fight through to the end. We can't guarantee we'll win everything, 
but we are there and we are in the ring and i think uh, that that is our rightful place Hmm. All right. No, thank you very much, Leon. And uh, before we say goodbye, I just have to uh, once again thank uh, my sponsors that uh, have sponsored this episode, and that is Bidvice, a uh, very good company that uh, if you want to get into crypto, you can just give them a contact, uh, give them a call or uh, give them a, an email and they will help you assist you. Because Bitvice is the only self-custody place to buy Bitcoin in South Africa. What that means is that if you buy Bitcoin through them, unlike any, uh, unlike any other exchanges, they never hold your Bitcoin for you. They send it straight to your own self-custody wallet, meaning that regulators can't freeze your Bitcoin and hackers can't steal it. Uh, and this is the proper way to manage Bitcoin, according to them. And uh, they've helped me a lot with all my crypto stuff. And uh, yeah, good guys behind it. I know the, the people that started this company. So uh, if you want to get into crypto and you're thinking about it, go check it out. Leon, thank you very, and there's a link in the description to their, to their website. Leon, thank you very much uh, for your time tonight. It was fascinating listening to you and uh, keep up the good fight uh, over there at Stellenbosch. Um, I wish you all the best and more power to you and all your allies over there. Um, and uh, yeah, Afrikaans is something I hold very uh, dear to my heart. So I've, I'm very, uh, I'm very fond of my language, and I love my language and culture. And I don't want it to die out or to be a, uh, to be wiped out. So uh, thank you very much for everything you are doing. Um, just finally, uh, thank you very much for everyone that also tuned in for your comments in the chat. Unfortunately, there seems to be a little bit of a, a error here on my side. I can't see your comments in the live chat anymore, so that's why they're not appearing on the screen anymore. It seems to be just a little bit of a, a glitch on StreamYard's side. But uh, yeah, what can you do about uh, little technical stuff like that? But uh, Leon, I also put a link to your Twitter account in the description for anyone that wants to follow you or get updates on uh, what you're doing over there at Stellenbosch. But thank you very much for your time tonight. And everyone, if you like this type of conversation, you can subscribe and leave a like as well. And uh, I'll check you on the next one. Thank you for everyone that shares all these episodes. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and have a nice weekend. And uh, Leon, if you have any final thoughts, uh, here's your opportunity now before we say goodbye. No, I was just to say thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone who tuned in. All right. Excellent. All right. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. And God bless.